Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to Montgomery County Council. Thank you all for joining us. Today, the council will receive an update on the state budget and the General Assembly session. We don't have any votes scheduled today, but as the General Assembly comes to an end, this briefing is an opportunity to get a better understanding of the budget and how it will impact the county. Without any further delay, let me turn it over to Ms. Chen to take us through the packet. Ms. Chen. Hello, everyone. Hi, I'm Carolyn Chen, Hi. legislative analyst. Hi. <laughs> Today is our last session for state legislation uh, that's for the live full council. First, just want to thank so much OIR for all their work and their team, and even the special guests we have on today, Susan, Farag, uh, Marcus Jones, I guess tomorrow, Jordan, Mark, and Ed Latner for all their help on the police reform. It's been a lot of work, so just want to thank you on that. Today we don't have any votes, but we will get an update on um, um, all the issues and priorities that the county council are interested in hearing on where uh, we are on the bills. And also we have uh, hot off the press uh, fiscal year 22 draft of the Montgomery County Capital Projects, which is in the budget, which we can go over with OAR. And just I know in my portfolio for other legislative initiatives and capital grants, I will have a separate update for you on, on that uh, list of projects. Um, with that, I believe Mel, or no, back to you, back to you, council member. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah. I'm Mel, here, but nobody um, will activate my video, so. There we go. <laughs> don't, don't take it personally. It happens to us all the time. Okay. Um, well, Ms. Ms. Winger, you can uh, begin in whatever update, there we go, um, that okay. you have for us. Okay, sure. Um, so you've got the packet that we sent, and there's not a lot in writing because this time of the year there are so many things in flux, particularly the issues that we're going to cover that we decided we're going to give you a verbal update because by the time we wrote it down and sent it to you, it's probably dated. Um, so as far as the 2021 session, no surprise, we're a, a week out from signing die. Um, so there's a, a number of issues left, but a couple of issues that are not left anymore. The operating budget and the capital budget have both passed. And so the capital sheet that you show, we're still marking it as draft just because uh, we're putting together a lot of pieces of paper to, to follow that, including um, some of the things that came down in supplemental number five. And that supplemental number five um, substantially increased the state's operating budget um, by about $3 billion. I think that we talked before the mystery of the 3.9. Well, it's no longer a mystery. And I think that there's been a lot of press coverage about that. So there, there's not a lot of detail, but suffice it to say that um, the state um, had a turn of good fortune, particularly where, where they were a year ago. And uh, with a lot of federal money, uh, revenue projections that uh, turned out to, to not be as bad as they thought. I think you know a lot about that. Glad to answer any questions about those capital projects, but otherwise, if you're good with that. We can move on into the updates of uh, uh, a major one that's left outstanding still is police reform. Um, that's been um, quite quite an experience to watch. Um, we we did think that there was likely a, a deal at the end of the week, um, but it looks like it's a, a little bit more in flux than um, we have typically seen of issues this big this late. Um, so um, we are looking at the um, amendments to amendments and amendments to reprints and trying to piece together uh, where we think things stand. And um, I'm gonna, uh, we've got um, Mark Ermey, uh, Jordan Sadisky, and Ed Lantner on the phone with Kathleen and me to go through that package. And I'm gonna start off, we've just kind of broken it down into the types of issues we've covered. I think uh, discipline and personnel records are, are very front and center here. And I'm gonna ask Kathleen to, uh, Go ahead and dig into that a little bit about what we what we see in these in these pieces of legislation, which actually is one big bill, House Bill 671, that's been amended. That bill initially came out of the House with everything that they were going to do in it, and then there's three Senate bills that we or three or four Senate bills that we've been watching, of which one is actually back in the Senate, and that's the one that deals with uh, use of force. Otherwise, everything uh, is, still remains in play in House Bill 670. Conference committee appointments have been made in the House, not in the Senate. So Kathleen and Ed and Jordan, you wanna take it? Thanks, Mel. So um, generally speaking, as Mel indicated, 
the LEOBR and the replacement of the LEOBR is in what was originally called the Speaker's Bill, House Bill 670. That was passed over to the to the Senate, as Mel indicated. The Senate amended it, sent it back to the House. They rejected those amendments or refused to accept them. So I'll walk through what is the general structure of the bill and the and the and, and then some of the key differences because we just don't know where they're going to land. But I, I'll just address the the, the key overarching uh, framework. So, in general, the Senate has agreed to the uh, framework that the House came up with, which involves a police accountability board outside of the formal disciplinary process, uh, a, an administrative charging committee, a trial board, a disciplinary matrix. So, in general, the Senate has agreed to that. Um, there are some differences. We don't know where the controversy is. We just know that the House uh, refused to uh, accept the Senate amendments. So in terms of the Police Accountability Board, again, you're very familiar with this concept. Uh, the Montgomery County Police Advisory Commission was often noted uh, as an example as this concept was being discussed. Um, primary role of this uh, board is to uh, coordinate and make with, LA, with the police department and make recommendations about police, about policing and policy matters. Um, uh, it, on the on the House side, they also gave some kind of authority regarding complaints to this entity, authorized this entity to receive complaints and review them, but it was very unclear what this entity was supposed to do with individual complaints. So the Senate actually struck that authority out of there, um, and, and it does not have that. Um, the membership has not changed. There's an agreement that uh, the, this will be established by local law. Each local jurisdiction will establish um, uh, you know, the membership, the only caveat is that there can be no active police officers. And again, there's agreement on that. In terms of the administrative charging committee, um, well, first in terms of process, the police department would actually do an investigation, would make findings, I think essentially findings of fact, and, and then turn over those investigatory files to an administrative charging committee, which will make the decision about whether to charge an officer and recommend a discipline to the chief. In terms of membership, there is some disagreement. The charging committee for the House is uh, the, the Police Accountability Board chair. That's the same uh, for the Senate. There's a civilian selected by the Police Accountability that's board. That's the same for the Senate. But the remaining three of the five members are different. The House has designees of the state's attorney and public defender and also the actual county attorney. Um, the Senate felt that there were all sorts of conflicts inherent in those offices. And even if you separate that those conflicts by designees, the Senate was very uncomfortable with that. They have substituted three other members. One would be a designee of the chief. One would be a civilian selected by uh, the county executive, and one would be a civilian select, selected by the chief that does not have an affiliation with the chief or with law enforcement. So those are the, those are the differences in terms of the, the membership of the charging committee. Again, we don't know where the where the controversies are yet. Um, the uh, the charging committee we've discussed before does uh, make recommendations about charging. They, if they do uh, recommend a charge, they follow a disciplinary matrix that's to be developed by the Maryland Police Standards and Training Commission. The, uh, they give that to the chief. The chief has the option of choosing to offer to the officer the same discipline that the charging committee has recommended or to offer a discipline that is more serious, a higher degree, but also falls within the matrix. And the bill uses the term offer um, because um, that's how it's envisioned. And if the officer accepts it, it's over. If the officer does not want to accept it, the officer can appeal to a trial board. So everything about the disciplinary matrix is the same. There's no disagreement in the bill. In terms of the trial board itself, there is uh, um, some differences in membership. As it came over from the House, it would include an active or retired administrative law judge or a retired uh, circuit court or district court judge. 
as well as a civilian appointed by the Police Accountability Board and a police officer of equal rank. Police officer of equal rank hasn't changed, but there's a specificity by the Senate that that officer is appointed by the chief. There's no change about the active or retired judges, but there was a concern in the rural counties and the smaller counties that they actually couldn't find one of those folks. And so they've added also that that spot could be an attorney appointed by the county executive that does not have um, conflicts of interest in the situation. Um, and uh, I said a, a civilian appointed by the Police Accountability Board, again, the same. Um, the only caveat with the Senate is that can't, that person can't be a member of the, the charging committee. So that's how the trial board is looking. Um, and the trial board uh, decision is final. If it, if it does go that far, it is final. Of course, it can be appealed to the circuit court. You know, there are some rules uh, regarding uh, investigations and, inter and interrogation compulsory investigations, compulsory drug tests, alcohol tests, polygraphs. Um, there, um, I'll leave it at that because this, those are parts of the bill that are very hard to piece together given all the technical amendments, but there are some rules in there. Where the gaps are that might be able to be addressed by local law, we're not sure, and I'll, and I'll get to that. Um, the, um, there are some, some additional authority given to the Maryland Police Standards and Training Commission about certification and decertification of officers. Um, uh, a key part is trying to get to um, a disclosure in this process of prior experience with a law enforcement officer and prior disciplinary problems. And there are rules regarding uh, requiring officers who or people who are applying for police officer positions to disclose prior experience and to authorize their prior employers to turn over personnel records. There's a, um, a very key provision that is giving the chiefs and sheriffs perhaps the most angst um, in terms of the association, um, and it relates to forfeiture of pension. Both bills uh, do allow, do, yeah, do authorize, allow forfeiture of pensions in whole or in part. It's discretionary, both the House and Senate. It gives discretion to an AG or state's attorney to go after that. It gives discretion to a court to do that, has some criteria. There are major differences in that area in the bill. That part of the bill for the House is two pages. That part of the bill for the Senate is 10 pages. It's very complex. It's very controversial. In terms of collective bargaining, the bill, this bill of still has uh, provisions that it does not apply to existing collective bargaining agreements, but the, the, but the effective date of this bill is delayed by a year. The effective date is July 1 of next year, 2022. So it would be the bill is not applicable to any collective bargaining agreement executed before uh, July 1, 2022. Uh, in terms of ongoing collective bargaining, the bill, the House, prohibited uh, collective bargaining any issue um, that would alter or negate the requirements of the bill. And the Senate was much more clear and much more prohibitive. The Senate language is intended to prohibit absolutely anything related to police discipline, interrogations, you name it. And it, uh, it specifically says it prohibits collective bargaining that's inconsistent with the bill or relates to police discipline or investigations, interrogations, polygraph, and drug and alcohol tests. So that, that, that's, a, that's a big difference. Um, in terms of what the county has been watching all along and, and very concerned about in terms of trying to avoid future litigation and future controversy, is to what extent is the bill clear about what is preempted or not preempted? in terms of local law. The, um, the House bill never had any language about express preemption, just didn't address it. The Senate bill um, had express, when it went over to the House, had very clear express preemption, except for local laws that related to uh, polygraphs, drug and alcohol tests, and interrogations. As in the bill in its for, uh, current, current posture, which has been agreed to uh, in terms of what the Senate sent back over to the House, 
is that there is no language about preemption, no express language. And I would defer to Ed on any discussion about what that means. But I think generally what we think it means is it would lead to, if there's litigation controversy, it would lead to courts applying factors and analysis that have been outlined in case law as to when certain issues are impliedly preempted or if the field is preempted. And again, I'll leave that. I'll leave that to Ed. And I think that's it. As I indicated, it's a one-year delayed effective date. And there is a funky piece that we don't understand the rationale for. But the part of the bill that relates to certification and decertification of officers is contingent on enactment of one of the Senate bills. And it's the bill that deals with body cameras, use of force, and employee assistance programs. So not quite sure why that's there. So that's an overview of police discipline. And happy to rest there or answer questions, whatever your guidance is. Any questions from colleagues? Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you, Melanie. Councilmember Reamer. Thank you. So I wanted to just understand, the House bill previously had these local boards. I think they were called police accountability boards. And I believe that they had the decision about a disciplinary action. And it sounds like you're saying that is no longer the case, that the House bill no longer has that, that there is a charging committee and there is an appeals board. But there is not this local accountability board. It was the term that was used. Am I understanding that correctly? No, there is. It's confusing. But there is an entity called the police accountability board. And it's outside the disciplinary process. It's somewhat like the police advisory commission you've created, except this bill specifies some duties that don't particularly match your current police advisory commission and the membership doesn't quite match. But the idea is that it's an advisory commission that's looking at, it's coordinating with police departments and looking to police matters and how can the county, in our case, improve policing, what policies could be changed that might help. So it's that kind of entity. And it also has the responsibility of appointing the civilians that will be members of two other entities, the charging committee, the administrative charging committee, and the trial board. So you have this outside police accountability board. And then every law enforcement agency must appoint an administrative charging committee. And that's where the membership does differ a bit. But it's that committee that then takes the findings of the investigation done by internal affairs and the police department, takes those findings and evaluates them and makes final decisions about findings of facts. And that entity, if they don't feel like they have enough information, can go back to the LEA and say, we need more information. They can go back to the LEA and say, you know, issue subpoenas to get more information. The Senate amendments specifically require that that entity, before they make a decision, review any body camera, body worn camera footage that's available. The Senate side also required that that committee give police officers the opportunity to make a statement of defense. So there's that entity. And they give their recommended discipline to the chief. And then it's the chief who can either impose that discipline or something higher within the range of the matrix. Officer doesn't take that, they move on to the trial board. Now, in the original Senate version, as I recall, there was not a trial board that the officer could then appeal to, or is that not? There was a trial board. There was not a charging committee. There was not a police accountability board on the outside. And there was not a charging committee. Under the Senate bill, the way the charging would have happened is that the internal investigation would happen. The chief would then ultimately make findings of fact and decide what discipline he wanted, he or she wanted to impose. There would be no disciplinary matrix. 
the officer could accept that discipline or the officer could appeal to a trial board. So the chief had more authority. There was no charging committee. The chief had more authority to impose discipline, make findings of fact, and then it went to a trial board under the Senate bill. And still, the difference there is, under the House version, findings of fact and discipline imposed by the trial board are final. Under the Senate version, before they agreed to this general structure, was that the trial board would make findings of fact that were final, including whether you're guilty or not, and would make recommendations about discipline, but the final discipline was in the chief's hands. And again, no disciplinary matrix. Thanks. Sure. Thank you. Council Member Katz. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, if I wasn't thoroughly confused before, Kathleen, and I think we can all understand how this is happening, I'm not clear on, first of all, I guess no one is clear on when this would happen and if this would happen and what would happen. But the effect of dates, I'm also confused on. We have pending legislation in Montgomery County that we were waiting to figure out what we could and couldn't do. And if the effect of date is a year out, if that's what I heard you say, if it's a year out, then does that mean that the pending legislation could be, if it, the word if is very large here, if it passes the way that it's being discussed at this point, does that mean that we could have our own legislation in the meantime? Or what does that mean? That is a very good question. For sure, I can say for sure, it's a one year delayed effective date. The bill does not take effect until July 1, 2022. I think, if you don't mind, I would defer to Ed Lattner on what that means in terms of, you know, I mean, it doesn't take effect. So, I mean, I guess you could have local law that's applicable for a year. But after July 1, 2022, the extent to which local law is preempted would apply. So anything, you know, that conflicts with this bill after July 1, 2022, in my opinion, is invalid. But again, Ed would be really the most appropriate person to answer that. And while Ed is answering that one, if the governor, and there again, the word if is involved here, but if the governor says, you know what, I'm not going to sign this. Right. And at this point, this late in the legislative session, I would assume they couldn't override it. And I would doubt if the governor would call a special session. So anyhow. Oh, sorry, Mr. President, did you want to say something? If he vetoes it, if he doesn't sign it, it still becomes law. Right. And I think he likes to do that. I think what Councilmember Katz might have also been touching on, and Mel kind of touched on it, which is it was assumed and spoken of quite openly that the goal of the House and Senate was to get a bill passed in time to get it to the governor, to make him, you know, if they get it to the governor, you know, this weekend, at some point this weekend, or even today, whatever the deadline was, he would have to make a decision about whether to veto it before session ended, and there would be an opportunity to override before the session ended. That became clear that they don't have that goal anymore. And so, yeah, it appears to be too late. And so, Councilmember Katz's question is the veto would occur after session, as far as we can tell right now, if it happens. Great. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions on this matter? Well, Ed was going to. Oh, I'm sorry, Ed. Yeah, sorry. The preemption issue is not like most of this. I don't have a satisfying answer for you. I can tell you under the Senate bill, I thought that the local bill, the council bill, could not go forward because the Senate bill had expressed preemption, although it was limited, but it had expressed preemption. This latest version of the LEOBR does not have 
uh, it's silent. In fact, it's removing the existing express preemption that's in the LEOBR. So I'd have to look at it more, but I'd say perhaps that, that your local bill has a better chance. But I still got, a, there's a lot of moving parts in this and they're still not all nailed down. Well, I, I, I'll accept the, I'll accept the definite, uh, definite answer, maybe. Uh, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. Thanks. I appreciate that. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I don't see any other requests to speak on this matter. So I think we can move on. All right. Captain, you want to go to personnel records real quickly? And... Sure. Um, I, I think folks are very familiar with this issue. Um, the, the House and Senate have agreed that, um, that personnel records that are relate to alleged misconduct of a police officer will now come out from underneath a mandatory um, non-disclosure and fall into a new discretionary disclosure. Um, so a custodian could release those records under certain circumstances and the bill incorporates provisions of current law about criteria that a custodian should consider before releasing those records. Uh, that doesn't apply to uh, certain types of um, minor minor rule violations. And this, this bill actually goes hand in hand with an expungement, uh, an expungement um, policy now that's reflected in House Bill 670. They're actually two separate bills, but they go hand in hand. And the reason is one of the most controversial um, parts of these discussions has been that the bill, as it, in its front, in its current form, to the extent that it takes investigatory records relating to misconduct out from underneath personnel records, there that's all investigations. Even if an officer is exonerated, even if uh, um, alleged, you know, alleged misconduct is found to be unsustained, that new discretionary disclosure under the MPA applies to even that category of records. And because of that, the Senate bill that went over had an expungement rule that said, look, for three years, we will let people get the records of unsustained and exonerated cases. But after three years, they can be expunged. And it came over the House with a flat out prohibition on expungement of any kinds of records, whether sustained or exonerated. And what the Senate appears to have agreed with and what they have sent back to the House is they've agreed to that. They've agreed to no expungement. So you now have the ability to get records and, and no expungement, uh, even of that category. So that's the personnel record bill. Um, you want to go to body worn cameras? Sure. So um, a, a key aspect of body worn camera, the body worn camera bill was that it, it would require every county and municipality to both the Senate and House version to have body worn cameras by certain dates. The, um, the, the agreement in the bills right now um, is that um, the three large jurisdictions that don't currently have programs, Harford, Anne Arundel, um, Howard, must have them by July 1, 2023, and smaller counties and all municipalities by July 1, 2025. Um, right now, the Maryland Police Standards Training Commission, uh, under current law, is, re is required to and has promulgated guidelines about every possible concept of body-worn cameras. Um, and I, I could speak to you about that if you'd like, but it's it's their guidelines. And what the bill says is, after the bill is enacted, a police department has to comply with those guidelines. And any any policies that a police department has regarding body worn cameras start with you've got to comply with the Maryland Police Standard and Training Commission um, requirements. Um, the bill has a provision that's been discussed here before at council relating to um, the 60 seconds before activation. Um, so the, the what's been agreed upon thus far is that if a camera has the capability of uh, recording uh, for up to 60 seconds uh, before before um, activation, then it, it, it must do that. It must at least do that. Um, it appears to provide possibly some flexibility for local for local governments to go further than that to require recording even before that. But 
Um, this, this bill also expressly prohibits collective bargaining on any requirement that would negate or alter what's in the bill. So I think those are the key pieces relating to body-worn cameras. All right. You want to you want to go to uh, the change in the tort claims caps? Sure. So I mean, so the, the House bill that includes the what, what's interesting among other things is what has been included in different bills. The, the Speaker's bill is now police discipline, repeal and replacement of the LEOBR, but it has a couple of other um, pieces. It has traffic stops. It has rules that police have to follow in terms of identification and. Um, explaining reasons for stops and rules governing traffic stops. It has provisions that change the tort liability limits for tortious acts involving law enforcement officers. Um, uh, you, may, you may be familiar that right now, tortious acts for local governments are limited to indi in individual claims to 400,000 and total claims in an incidence, 800,000. For, for now for law enforcement officer acts, um, that's increased to 890,000 for uh, an individual claim and 1.335 million for total claims. There is one difference between the House and Senate. Senate applies that only to intentional uh, tortious acts and omissions. That's not in the House bill. Uh, another small difference in terms of an annual inflator that is not there that the House wanted. And uh, and again, this, this bill has a July 1, 2022 effective date. So that's tort liability. Also thrown into that House Bill 670 are, is a loan repayment assistance program, a scholarship program. Um, and, I, and I think that was the key for that bill. And, and two other, and another, another bill, I'll just say quickly, establishes employee assistance programs and an early intervention program for officers at risk of excessive use of force. Kathleen, could you elaborate at all on the loan assistance or scholarship program? Sure. Um, the bill creates um, a higher education loan uh, re assistance repayment program for um, for um, police officers, folks who are police officers, mm -hmm. um, and and it requires details to be worked out in regs, et cetera, but it's for existing police officers. In terms of the scholarship, it's not a little, few differences between the House and the Senate, but in for both, the scholarship is for both students who want to become police officers and police officers who want to further their education. And, um, and it has to be used at a public college or university. And one difference between the House and the Senate the House specifically says it's, you've got to be in a degree program relating to criminal law, criminology, criminal justice. And the Senate had a whole discussion about how police officers need all sorts of educational background and simply indicated that the scholarship is available uh, if there's a determination that the de degree program would further either the student's career in law enforcement in the future or an existing officer's um, career. Um, is that enough detail, Mr. Hucker? Would you? Uh, thank you. Can you confirm it's uh, it's funded with state dollars, not county dollars? It's state dollars. <laughs> Great. Phew. Um, <laughs> and do you know the terms of it at all, how generous it is? Well, there is no mandatory funding that I'm aware of, okay. unless, I, unless I'm missing it. I'll, I'll check on that while we're talking. Um, no, I apologize. There's a mandatory appropriation for the scholarships of 8.5 million, um, 6 million for students intending to become officers and 2.5 million for existing police officers. Both current and aspiring police officers in the future. Yes, sir. Great. Okay. That's good to know. Thank you. Yes, sir. Okay. Sure. Um, I, and I apologize for the loan program. There's also a mandatory appropriation of 1.5 million. 1.5 million? Yeah. Oh, one yeah. Point... I, we didn't come back to that. How does the loan repayment work? That's not much. Yeah, I tell you what, it requires the um, it requires the state <laughs> to develop regulations 
it's it's very short. I mean, literally that part of the bill is two, maybe almost just two pages. Um, so honestly, it just looks to me like there's regs that need to be worked out. The regs. Yeah. <laughs> All right, but very okay. I'm going to like uh, back clean up here, hopefully pretty quickly on just some other uh, things that are in the Senate bills. Um, the one bill that's come across back to the Senate is is uh, the use of force bill. It's Senate Bill 71, or it's it's over back in the Senate. And again, similarly, all these these packages they they want a use of force statute. It's never uh, this has not been codified before. Um, both houses agree that they would like this codified. So the piece of legislation that looks like, I think, I would think that someone would agree to it. I, um, it requires every police officer to sign an affirmative written sanctity of life pledge to respect every human life and act passion towards others. You have to undergo training on when to draw a firearm or when, you know, how and when to work to de-escalate. And you, upon, when you complete all your training, you have to sign a training completion document stating that you understand and will comply with the Maryland Use of Force statute. Um, as far as use of statute, it's it um, can only be used against a person if under the totality of the circumstances, the force is necessary and proportional to prevent threat of physical injury. If you recall, some of this was, you know, about uh, about property as well. That's that's not there. And also it's to effectuate a legitimate law enforcement objective. Um, other than that, that's that's the that's the big the big picture of use of force. Um, I think something that has been a moving target it's about who's going to investigate, and I know that you all have been involved in these conversations too because the state's attorneys uh, at the county levels have all felt very strongly about this. Uh, but the Senate bill um, that was amended in the House and and is over still on the House floor, it's on third reader. It creates an independent investigative unit within the office of the attorney general. Um, they do all the they do the investigations, and they can use the state police to help them out, or any other civilian to help conduct the investigation. And once they complete that within 15 days, they send it back down to the state prosecutor um, of the county that has the jurisdiction to prosecute. And <clears throat> what that what they are sending down is their detailed findings, including whether or not a crime has been committed and a recommendation about prosecution. So that's a change there. Um, as, far, as far as search warrants and no-knock warrants, what they've come up with um, in Senate Bill 178 is, is a hybrid of things. You don't get any significant surprises, the application. You, you got to just do a lot more work to actually, you know, secure a no-knock warrant. And they even went down further than current law on when these warrants become void, all warrants. So it used to be your warrant was void in 15 days, now it's 10 in this piece of legislation. Um, and no-knocks can only, or they're, they have to be executed between 8 a.m. and 7 p.m. So that's the story of no-knocks. I'm not even going to talk about the reporting requirements. Suffice it to say, there are significant reporting requirements. The good thing about these reporting requirements for no-knock warrants, the use of force um, warrants generally, is that the information is, is going to be standardized and it's going to become public. Um, however, there's some significant technical issues because uh, two bills with two different effective dates have similar provisions relating to reporting requirements that have to get worked out, but there's plenty of time to do that. There's a week. Or, or longer, given uh, the fact that one of the bills is not effective till July 1, 2022. And this is one thing I will say about this very late effective date. Um, if there's problems, there's time, you know, next session to come back in as this becomes more well thought out and maybe less pressured to fix some problems. Mm -hmm. And that's the package. And again, moving target, you know, this is a fascinating one. I've done this for a long time and I've never seen a package like this. As yep. far as uh, not being able to, yeah, not being able to read the strategy clearly, you know, you usually kind of know where this is going to land. I don't know, where, don't know where this. I think we could probably move on to the next topic. I think. Okay. Um, Thanks. Let's move on down to are we at elections? Kathleen, you want to provide a brief update of elections? 
Sure. I guess the first thing I would say is that our Montgomery County legislators have been outrageously busy on election reform and successful. And it was amazing as I was reviewing these bills that I just want to share with you quickly today. Um, they're all Montgomery County legislators. Um, so I'll start with um, a bill that uh, is a Senator Kramer bill that's already been passed by the House and the Senate and uh, a Delegate Wilkins bill that uh, is related is being conformed to this bill uh, and, and will pass as well. But this bill, you know, comes out of everything we learned from our COVID experience and it requires the state board to create a permanent absentee ballot list. If you always want to get um, an absentee ballot, a mail-in ballot, you can get on this list and you will always get it. Um, for the 2022 and 2024 elections, um, and perhaps that's just an experiment to see how it goes, but it specifies 2022 and 2024 elections, local boards must also send to everyone who's not on that list already, um, must send um, uh, a request for absentee ballot. Um, so must send to every eligible voter a request for absentee ballot that they may or may not return. Um, it has some requirements regarding ballot boxes, a few, a few requirements regarding uh, canvassing restrictions and um, putting campaign materials on ballot boxes, but um, it primarily relates to those absentee ballot uh, requirements. And um, again, it has passed the, the House and Senate uh, and um, will take effect on June 1 of this year. If there's not any questions, I would move on to the next bill. Okay. Okay. Um, another bill by Delegate Lutke uh, relates to early voting centers. And um, as you know, current law requires uh, in Montgomery County, it depends on the size of your county, the number of your eligible voters, but in Montgomery County, it is required that we have 11 voting centers. We also have um, a possibility of one additional if we, if our local board and Sorry, was somebody speaking? Oh, okay. So out here, sorry. Oh, that's okay. So, so there's also under current law a possibility of one additional early voting center if there's agreement between the state board and essentially agreement the language between the state board and the and the local board. And this bill expands the number of early voting centers in counties depending on the number of eligible voters. For us, it goes from a mandatory 11 to a mandatory 13, and there is still that potential for an additional um, with agreement between the state board and local board. And the bill also puts into law factors regarding location. It specifically requires local boards to consider certain factors when deciding location. Um, and, um, and makes those decisions about location subject to approval by the state board. So that bill, um, that bill has passed. Shall I move on to the next one? Okay. Sure. Okay. Yep. So this, um, uh, this bill again is a delegate Wilkins bill and it relates to, um, um, it, it facilitates voting by both in eligible incarcerated individuals and folks who leave incarceration. Um, for folks who are incarcerated, um, if you are incarcerated because of a felony, you cannot vote. But if you're incarcerated because of a misdemeanor or if you're incarcerated because you're pre-trial, you're an eligible voter. And so this bill um, requires certain steps to happen, including putting ballot boxes at correctional facilities um, and a number of other pieces that facilitate voting for eligible um, eligible incarcerated folks. Uh, also for folks who leave correctional facilities, uh, it requires the State Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services to uh, implement a whole program of getting information to um, to folks as they're leaving about their voting rights and how to vote, et cetera. And it's actually very complex, but that's the that's the general piece of that bill. It's passed the House and it's in the Senate. So we're not sure yet what EHE will do with it, what the Senate committee will do. 
I'll just, I'll mention uh, maybe one just more key bill. Unfortunately, it hasn't gained traction, but it is a bill that was important to us. And our two, two of our Montgomery County delegates were fighting for it. Um, Delegate Plakovich Carr and Senator Kagan um, were, had took on, among other things, a MAKO initiative to codify cost share and try to clarify when the state, what the state covers and to, to clarify when the, when the county covers. Um, you know, 50, when is there a 50-50 cost share? Also to provide more oversight to the state board on contracts, because one of the major problems mm-hmm. these days is the state, state administrator gives their state, gives the state board, and a lot of times, fait accompli decisions about contracts um, and who's going to pay for them. That then goes to the Board of Public Works, and that is, in essence, often fait accompli. And this bill would have would tried to provide uh, more transparency and oversight authority to the state board, and also when it goes to the Board of Public Works, to disclose to the Board of Public Works when is the state board expecting local funds? Because right now it is very non-transparent as to when that's true. And the, it's very hard to kind of make sure the Board of Public Works has information about that. So that bill unfortunately has not gained traction in the House and Senate. So unless there's a miracle, I, I think there are still some efforts to get something about cost share on possibly another bill that might move. But uh, right now we're, right now we don't, we don't see the line of, we don't, we don't see a line of sight on that one. So thank you. Would you like me to move on to transportation? Please. Yep. Okay. So I think- Well, while, while we're on ways and means, um, it's not on here, but is there an update on the local taxation? Uh, the bill, I think the bill is, this is the brackets. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I saw the bill, I, I, the bill, I, it may have already passed even. Both bills have crossed. I think I saw, I, I know I saw the bill come out of the Senate. The House bill's been over in the Senate for a long time. I'm, I would think um, that that bill will pass. It does not have the 3.5, you know, top rate increase in it. So I would hope that it would not run in into any problems right. in the right. office. Thanks. <laughs> what does it, sorry, if I, what does it do if it doesn't have the top rate? Can you remind us? Well, it allows it allows for um, for counties to create uh, bracketed systems down low. All right, so it particularly benefits if you're not already at the top rate, which is 3.2. So, for example, Anne Arundel County, I believe that the county executive there intends to go up to 3.2, right. and that mm-hmm. would allow him to do a revenue neutral system because he's raising the top rate to do make some changes you know down down low in, in the lower income bra- or there are no brackets now uh, but to create a bracketed system so that the local income tax could be more progressive yes progressive. and someday hopefully yeah someday hopefully there will um, a place like Montgomery County will be able to take advantage of that in some way but as it stands in order to do that we would have to offset any revenue because you couldn't make you couldn't impose brackets into our existing system without foregoing revenue, essentially. I think that, yes, I, I, it could, it's worth yeah. The time. yeah, how about yes would be the answer, I think. Yeah. Yeah. That's the math. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Thanks. Right. Um, quickly move on to transportation then. There are kind of really three pieces of legislation I think are uh, of, of interest. I'm going to really only focus on one because I think it might be the only one that passes. Uh, there is the P3 bill out there. It, you know, got a lot of press attention, and it would seem on the surface to make a lot of sense. Um, it would, of sorts, um, overhaul the P3 procurement system uh, for very large projects, projects over a half a billion, by creating an additional layer of review. Uh, the bill is over in the Senate, um, but I, I don't know what its future is. Um, it, it's, it's been, I think it's been there before. Oh, that's a tough one. Uh, the Promise Act, is something the county has always supported. It um, was in last year too. It codifies commitments that have been made uh, about the traffic relief plan. Um, the bill is heavily amended this year and it is um, sitting in the Senate. And I think that there, there is some resistance to it in the Senate Budget and Tax Committee, um, even from members of Montgomery and Prince George's County where that project has the greatest impact. So. Um, it would be my judgment, and I could be wrong, that it does not advance again this year. 
However, there's another piece of legislation that I do, that I, I believe will pass. Um, it was focused on the, um, the MTA and uh, create and mandated appropriations to um, satisfy state of good repair for the MTA system. Um, it's been in a couple of years, uh, but now they've got uh, significant mandated appropriations in it. There's also a study about MARC going into Western Maryland. But one piece that we're particularly um, focused on, I think, in the county and was a negotiation that I think um, helped, you know, support uh, votes for the package was that for a number of years now, we have been after legislation to help the small businesses that have been impacted by the purple line um, offset revenue losses from the construction that's been going on. And this piece of legislation creates such a program that would be run by the State Department of Commerce and funds the program. In fact, we were fortunate in supplemental number five that there's going to be funding for this program starting in fiscal year 22. So there's a half a million to fund the program. Again, this is for businesses that are under 20 people, and the grants are limited to 50, 000, up to you know maximum of $50,000 a year. But it starts with $500,000 program in FY22, and then a million dollars each for FY23 and for FY24. So I think that that's a uh, really good news. There's some other. I mean, it, it, it's not as if we don't have you know any uh, affiliation with you know MTA. Uh, and particularly Mark. So overall, we would view it, I think, as a, a pretty strong package. It's very good for Baltimore and their system, and I think it's also helpful for the Washington region. So looking like looks like that bill is good is probably uh, on a path to victory this year. So uh, that's it on the transportation front. I thought I'd ask Amy to talk just a little bit about what's going on, on the housing front. Obviously, we have some the legislation, some significant issues across state and housing every state does have issues there and also on the environmental front so amy you want to pick it up sure good afternoon um i will be very brief on the housing front you'll recall i brought a fairly substantial package uh early on in session um involving a right to counsel increases in... loud. anyone else uh oh. down the volume a little bit sorry okay is this better i don't know okay um I'm not sure how to change it. I don't know. Just lower my volume, so it's okay. I apologize. My other computer's not working. I'm on a kid's computer. Um, so the um, much of the package crossed from the House to the Senate, and um, it is just sitting in the Senate. The cross file bills did not move. Um, I believe mostly because they're in judicial proceedings and. Um, They've been working on the police reform package. So we may see some movement. I just wanted to highlight one um, bill, Delegate Wilkins bill. Um, it was fairly heavily amended um, and it essentially would codify the, um, the executive order, which would allow for um, folks to use uh, the, the catastrophic health emergency, substantial loss of income. Um, provision that's in executive order right now. Um, folks ha are looking to see, um, advocates are looking to see if potentially there could be um, some tenant holding over provisions added to that. But as of right now, uh, the bill, like the other bills are sitting in um, Senate judicial proceedings. So that's basically my update on housing. On um, environment, you'll recall I bought a large bill uh, to you Last time we met, um, the Climate Action Bill, it was the Senate package, and it was pretty substantial. Uh, the House um, has, has um, the House Environment and Transportation has acted on it. However, it still needs to go through the Economic Matters Committee. So there are um, draft amendments that have been approved by the Environment and Transportation Committee. They are uh, fairly significantly different from the Senate. So it would reduce the, the Senate bill had 60% um, uh, increase in the um, greenhouse gas emission reduction uh, from 2006 levels. This would bring that down to 50% by 2030, but keeps the same, the net zero by 2045. Um, other additional changes, um, there were some substantial energy conservation requirements for buildings um, in the bill. Uh, that has been 
change substantially, but again, the local governments can have more significant and more stringent standards, so that would impact us. There was school construction components to it requiring net zero schools. That has been taken out um, on the house side. They made a few changes to the um, tree planting provisions, but the one uh, provision I did want to highlight was Delegate Bagley had a standalone bill about a Blue Ribbon Solar Commission to study solar across the state and the needs of each individual jurisdiction. That bill has now been amended into the House version. Uh, there is a provision where somebody from local government can sit on that. So um, again, who's to say you know, which will uh, go forward and what provisions will um, move forward, but I did want to highlight those provisions for you. Or the fact that the bill may not advance because these these changes are significant. Yeah. Um, so it's not clear what the future of the bill. Um, okay. If you have, if you want to, if you want a hard stop, hard stop at one thirty, we'll send you in writing what's going on with broadband. Otherwise, uh, I'd ask Kathleen to touch on that. Your your call, Mr. President. Yeah. Just on the last one, um, and it's, I know it still has to go through ECM, as you mentioned, um, did Kumar in, include the language he was thinking about of having a floor for each county as to how much solar adaption? They yes. He did, okay. He did. I, I sent, the language that I've seen, again, everything I have is draft, so I don't want to hinge on it, but it says the commission shall set the make recommendations regarding land use uh, needs, and then it will look at um, population and land size of each of the local jurisdictions. Okay. Yes, and what I'm, is the status of the community choice legislation? So that's pretty, yeah, it's, at, it's, it's on the Senate floor tonight. Unanimously. Um, yep. yep, it actually, unanim right, Amy, just let me know that our, our one, our one, one senator from Baltimore County who took a pass actually uh, went, uh, went green with the crowd, so it's unanimous out of finance that does have an yeah. amendment on mm -hmm. the bill. Um, it was out of necessity, and whatever it does, we can work with it. And I, we're looking forward to the bill. Hopefully, uh, moving right on out there and getting a thumbs up from the house. So yeah, uh, it's, it's pretty good news. It's very good news. Yep. So, Mr. President, do you want to talk about broadband, or do you want? To... Um, yeah. Well, quickly. Okay. Okay. Kathleen. Okay, and this can be quick. It's it's ba uh, broadly, it's very good news. Um, in supplemental budget number five, which Mel has talked about, which brought the ARPA federal money, at least some of it, into, this, into the state budget, includes about $300 million for different broadband programs. Uh, it, it currently has about $120 million in the FY22 budget, and then FY22 through FY24, the remainder um, can be out. It's in the dedicated purpose account um, for, for fleshing out for those, those three fiscal years. But... The money can be used for for the kinds of um, kinds of things that that Montgomery County and you have been concerned about. Um, it can be used. There's money dedicated to um, subsidizing service fees for for folks who are having affordability issues. Same with subsidies for devices that are need to access the internet. There's some. Uh, these are big chunks of money. Uh, 45 million for the subsidies for service fees. 30 million for the devices. 30 million for infrastructure and deployment uh, support. This is this is all FY22, and 15 million for grants and loans that improve access to, to local governments. Again, there's a, a, a close to another um, 180 million in the future years, which I could share with you if you'd like. But it again, it's it's the broad types of categories that Montgomery County and the council and the county executive uh, are felt exactly what we need, including training. Um, and education um, for folks who need to learn how to use uh, broadband, et cetera. So very good news on the money front. And also accompanying that will be a bill that, that will pass both the House and Senate to create, to, to create a whole new state um, structure for supporting broadband expansion and access, reliable access to broadband. It's turning the Office of Rural Broadband into a statewide office that is right. intended to assist the whole state. Right. Um, you know, it requires a state plan. Um, it requires, it creates a digital inclusion fund, um, which will subsidize the, the fees, the digital devices, the training. It, includes, it creates a separate fund, which is for infrastructure. It's a, it's a very comprehensive bill that really reflects um, prioritizing 
um, prioritizing, <laughs> including remote learning, prioritizing broadband expansion and, and reliable access for everyone in the state. So it's got lots of details, but it's it's good news on both fronts. Yep. Okay. I don't see any questions from my colleagues. This is terrific news. Uh, Councilmember Reamer. Just on that topic, it, it is good news. It, it will certainly be funding for the parts of the county that don't have broadband yet. You know, the Ag Reserve, I believe, is really the only place where it has. But I think it would be really helpful for our executive branch team to figure out how we can make sure we are able to access more funding, perhaps through the digital inclusion provisions. Um, you know, there's got to be some ways for us to uh, have projects yeah. that we can get funded through this. I'll just quickly say that Gail Roper and Mitzi Herrera and others are already right on top of that, just trying to figure out, because they're going to have to coordinate with this new this new office, and one of the roles of the new office is to work closely with local governments in all sorts of ways, including helping them identify federal funds, helping them get federal funds, allocating state funds. So, so, I, I, so I can tell you, it, it's already begun, and you're absolutely right. Okay, Council Member Navarro. Thank you. I, just, I wanted to share with my colleagues that the Government Operations um, Fiscal Policy Committee has begun uh, this uh, conversation, and uh, we are actually going to have a follow-up session to um, understand better uh, the state money that is coming and uh, how that aligns with the projects that are underway. There's a lot of very exciting things occurring, so um, stay tuned, and for colleagues, I know Councilmember Rice has participated uh, because he is leading on the national level on these issues. But any any colleague that is interested in this, also you know, invite them to to join us. Thank you. Terrific. Thanks. That is it yeah. for us. If unless you have something else you want to raise, it, it looks like we're good. So um, thank you all so much for all your hard work. Um, and uh, we'll see everyone tomorrow. Thanks so much for the helpful update. Thank you. Bye-bye.